So my childhood ambition was to be a writer. For me, the loneliness did not come from not interacting with people. I was actually interacting with a ton of people. I run a, a group program for women who want deeper relationships with themselves and other people. And that's the first thing we talk about is what is your relationship with yourself like? What do you tell yourself about yourself? Because I really believe that the quality of love that we give ourselves reflects the quality of care that other people will give us. Hi, Jillian, how are you doing? I am good. I was just wondering if you could hear, there's some like very vocal birds outside yes, yes. my window right now. Do you yes. hear them? Yes. <laughs> so we're going to have some nature in this recording. Yes, actually it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I love them. They're my friends. They're my bird friends. <laughs> do you have any pet? A dog or a cat? I do not. So I actually, I just moved last week um, for a little bit to Austin, Texas. Okay. So we do not have a pet, uh, but our landlord, Kshistoff, has a dog. Okay. So his dog is around, which is nice. So, okay. I just, um, I always ask this question to the guest. So basically this is my favorite signature, signature question to start with. Because when I ask this, I usually expect some, you know, interesting stories from childhood. And it's, it's very fascinating for me to hear about different childhood ambitions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so what was your childhood ambition and how was your childhood? So my childhood ambition was to be a writer. Okay. Um, I love words. I, I still have a box of my diaries from when I was a kid, starting from when I was like eight years old. Um, that was definitely something that I was drawn to is just the, um, the, the art of writing and expressing myself. It felt very safe. It feels like a, a safe place. Like as a kid, you know, I feel like at least for me, I felt like, oh, there's certain things I can't share with my parents. I can't share with my friends. Uh, you're not really in control of your social life as a child. And so to have a place to express everything that's going on, it's, it's still kind of my safe place. Right. So I also had this di I also have this diary um, from when I was in class one or two, basically the primary school. And now when I read it, I was like, oh my God, I'm such a stupid. And it's so embarrassing for me to read that. <laughs> like <laughs> what was wrong with me? Yes, what was exactly. <laughs> so how was um, college life for you? College life. So when I was in college, I really loved doing uh, improv mm -hmm. and sketch comedy. Uh, that was my big passion. Like I was in my school's sketch and improv group. I had a, my school had like a TV network. So I was like writing funny stuff for a TV show. I was writing satire articles for our school's newspaper. That was my everything. Uh, I actually ended up moving to New York City because I wanted to write for late night TV which is not a thing a lot of people know about me. Uh, so I think I, I definitely had a lot of pain in me in, in college that was not super expressed. And I used humor as a way to kind of get through that and to kind of like poke fun at myself, keep things a little more surface, as can be the case when you're using humor. And yeah, that was kind of like my, my main identity as a college student. Right. So basically, I also heard one of the stand-up comedians in India, stand-up uh, comic in India, say, uh, talk about this. He said that humor is something which you used to talk when you cannot talk openly about your experiences. So you, you would rather use humor to talk about them. Mm -hmm. Completely. And I don't think I consciously realized I was doing that at the time. Uh, but looking back, I think it, it was easier for me to use humor than to say like, you know, I, 
I don't really have a great relationship with myself or like, I don't love, I feel like I'm struggling to love myself. I feel kind of like I don't belong. I feel lonely. So um, when was, was, so oh, when, was when was the point you realized that humor is just an escape for me and I need to, you know, rather sit down and self introspect. Yeah, it's, I mean, it still comes out for me. Like when I'm, a little uncomfortable or with I'm when I'm with someone I might feel a little more on edge with I definitely still use humor not nearly as often uh, I think I realized how much I was using it when I started kind of falling out of love with the comedy scene in New York City and I think I thought when I left college and moved to New York that things would be different and like comedy adults would be more mature and I'd be able to kind of grow into myself as an adult and my judgment. And this is very sweeping and definitely not true for everyone. Um, was just that like there wasn't necessarily the level of maturity that I was looking for and to say like, okay, if this is not my world, like who are my people? Where do I go? Right. And being around people suddenly, like freelance writers and entrepreneurs who humor was not their first language, <laughs> realizing like, oh, there's a different way of being with this. Right. So I read this beautiful line somewhere uh, on the social media, as far as I remember, the world does not need more successful people and CEOs, but it needs more change makers and policy makers and happiness advocates. So I was, yes. as I was reading about you, how you moved to New York City and then you realized you were lonely there. So how do you, how would you um, summarize your experience in living such a fast city and not being able to interact with anyone, meet like-minded people? I think for me, the loneliness did not come from not interacting with people. I was actually interacting with a ton of people. Like, when I look at my calendar from when I moved to the city, I hit the ground running. I was going to plays. I was going to shows. I was going to museums. I was going to bars. I was going on dates, all the stuff. Um, I think it was two things. I didn't have the knowledge of myself to know that I needed to slow down, take some time to reflect on what I actually wanted take some time to process how I was feeling because it's a huge transition moving to a new place as I am re-experiencing right now. Uh, but also that the people around me were not necessarily as open or as, as, like into the things that I wanted to get into of like talking about love and consciousness and community and all of these things that I'm so into, uh, they, that just wasn't their thing. And so I needed to find the people who that was their thing. Right. So I think this is a very important thing, which I realized by like just now that it is like, you cannot, loneliness is not just about like, I'm talking to people, but you can talk to people and still feel lonely and empty inside. Completely. That it's, I, I run a, a group program for women who want deeper relationships with themselves and other people. And that's the first thing we talk about is what is your relationship with yourself like? What do you tell yourself about yourself? Because I really believe that the quality of love that we give ourselves reflects the quality of care that other people will give us. Right. And if we can't do that, then we're going to keep attracting like toxic relationships or, or at the very least dissatisfying relationships. So can you tell the listeners about the joy list? Mm. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the joy list is a weekly newsletter of events that people can go to by themselves and leave with a new friend. And our mission is to make the world a less lonely place. Uh, and it started in November 2016. I've been doing it every week since then. And 
I mean, it used to be just for New York City, New York City based events. And now because of coronavirus, I have transitioned it to being virtual events, which has been fun and challenging because now suddenly I can feature an event from anyone, anywhere. Right. And that, that's been really interesting. So do you, uh, can you like narrate to us any particular um, event you remember while you were making this community and making people interact with each other that gave you immense happiness? Yeah, I think, well, in terms of my own personal experience with the event scene in New York City, it, it really was a test in getting comfortable getting out of my own comfort zone. Uh, and so a really big example for me personally was going to dance events in New York because I was petrified of dancing. I was so scared of it. If you put me on a dance floor, I would just like freeze and be just scared. Uh, and I noticed people around me like to dance and I wanted to feel included. And so one of the events that I went to is this space created by a woman named Tasha Blank uh, called The Get Down. And I talk about it in my book, but it was this experience where I was in line with all these people who seemed like they already knew each other. There was this guy in front of me who I was talking to and he was wearing like very businessy clothes, like a button up shirt and khaki pants. Um, and we get in to where like you're paying for tickets and stuff. And this guy who I kind of assumed that we were both new, that it was his first time and my first time. And he just takes off his shirt and his pants and he's wearing these like tiny neon yellow shorts and like a mesh shirt <laughs> underneath his clothes. And I was like, okay, this is a different world. And I got there too early, which I did not realize where they people were just warming up. There weren't very many people there. And I kind of just awkwardly floated around for like an hour until more people got there. Um, but I just really remember there's this one moment where they always do this thing where everyone puts their arms around each other and gets in a circle and starts like running in a circle. Uh, and that someone just must have seen me standing there looking uncomfortable and they just kind of like put their arm around me and brought me in. Um, we were just like jumping up and down, screaming yes over and over again. I just remember being like, wow, like this is, and everyone's sober and it's just a completely different way of living. And so the reason why I love promoting these events that have these moments of connection is because I know what it's like to feel like an outsider and scared uh, and how powerful it is to be in a space where people genuinely want you to feel like you belong. It, it's a really rare and beautiful thing. Right. So how far would you say you've come in this journey of creating a safe space for yourself? <sighs> Man, I am in it right now if i'm being honest because I've, i lived in new york city for five years i imagine i'm going to go back i don't really know uh, and i'm in a new city right now and it's um it's really challenging for multiple reasons but one obviously coronavirus that my ability to meet new people <laughs> is really limited uh and so kind of like the people I'm with right now are the people I'm with. And what I am telling myself is I'm just really being, this is my ultimate test in how much can I just love myself with not having the spiritual community around me that I'm used to, not having a romantic partner. And I'm like, all, I'm also around a lot of romantic couples right now, like people who have partners and I, I ended my relationship with my partner before I moved here. And so it's just like the ultimate, <laughs> like, and all so, right, can I put into practice what I say I do? So it's like, if you can, if you can get through this, you can get through anything. 
right? It's, it's pretty ridiculous. I think the, the biggest shift for me has been just feeling the longing that I'm feeling and not telling myself that it's bad or that it's shameful or I should be okay. Because like if a friend told me the situation I'm in, I would say, of course you feel lonely. Of course you feel scared. Of course you, you wish that you had someone to snuggle and love on. Like, that's very human. Uh, and there's a, there's a spiritual teacher, John Wineland, who talks about intimacy and sexual polarity, all these fun things. Um, and I was on a group call with him, and he gave me the advice to just like treat this longing that I'm feeling as something that is sacred and to just take time every day to feel like how badly I want to feel like I'm with my people and how badly I want to feel loved and to just let it hurt. Like it's, it's okay it's to sucks. allow yourself. So yeah. how do you think we can create a, you know, safe space? Uh, safe space for millennials or Generation Z so that they're comfortable talking about these topics like loneliness, feeling the mm -hmm. emptiness, not being able to accept themselves. How do you think we can do that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think one of the most important things is the energy of the facilitator. This is a thing that I am learning more and more as I get more into kind of like what makes a really good facilitator. But I think it's very important that the facilitator sets the bar for vulnerability. So if the facilitator just sees himself as kind of like the leader and that, oh, me being vulnerable makes me seem like I'm not strong right. or like I'm not a good leader, people can't trust me. I think it's actually the, the opposite where if you as the leader of a conversation can talk about your own experiences with loneliness, your own experiences with feeling like you don't belong, that signals to the other people in the room that this is a space where you're allowed to share in that way. And it shifts the tone of the conversation, and permissions people to go a little deeper. So that's a huge one. Uh, and another tip I would give is to let people know what they have in common in the space because it is very, it's very obvious, but I've noticed that repeating this multiple times kind of helps people drop their walls a little. So if you say, we, everyone who is in this Zoom call, for example, we all want to talk about why we feel disconnected right now, why we feel lonely. We all share this struggle right now. There's like this feeling of solidarity that me and whoever this person is, even if we've never met before, we share this and that brings us closer together. I feel more comfortable sharing. So those are, those are two tips. Uh, I'm curious if that's like helpful, if there's other things I can address in that world for you. Yes, these, those are helpful, definitely. So it's like putting your guard down sometimes and allowing others to know what you feel. Totally, like that's, that's such an art. Right. So also for someone who's very socially awkward and introvert and doesn't really prefer going out and feels emptiness or lonely as we talk about. So what yeah. would be the first step you would suggest for a person like that? Yeah, I think that first of all, I think at least in America, I can't speak for, for India, but culturally there's definitely kind of a preference towards extroversion that like being an extrovert is better. Um, and that's not true. I think a lot of people who are deeply self-aware are introverted. And so if going out a lot isn't your thing, that's okay. And to just be very intentional then with when you do go out, what kinds of people do you want to surround yourself with? because I know a lot of people, and I definitely did this as well, kind of just hang out with the people who you're with by default. Right. Like, oh, we went to school together or we work together. And so these are my friends. And I believe that friends can be part of your spiritual path. And so to say, 
what kind of people will really lift me up? Like, where do I want to go in my life? And who can I surround myself with? Who can take me to that place? And it's, I'm aware that might sound kind of like selfish, but that I think we all, we all give and take from each other. Mm -hmm. We can all, we all influence each other. That's just how humans are. And to say like, okay, who are the people in my city that I want to be more like? Is it the like really cool salsa dancer ladies? Is it the awesome Buddhist meditation people? Whatever it is. Uh, And to go and be with those people. That, and so that hopefully that feels a little less scary with that intention versus I'm just going to go to this huge party filled with random people and expect it to be fun. Cause I'm, I'm more extroverted than introverted. And I don't like that. I don't like walking into a huge party filled with people. I don't know. It feels exhausting. Uh, And so just to normalize that feeling, because I know with a lot of people I talk to, they say, oh, I should be okay with that. Or like, I should love that. There's no should. It doesn't, that's just kind of how we're fed through movies and TV, how we're supposed to hang out with people. But it doesn't mean that it's true. So what do you talk about in your book, The Unlonely Planet? Yeah, so my book, Unlonely Planet, I talk about, so the, the subtitle is How Healthy Congregations Can Change the World. Okay. And a lot of people, when they hear the word congregation, they think of a church, rightly so. A congregation is also a, a word that is associated with church. But what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make in my book is that a lot of young people, and people in general, but especially young people, are not comfortable in organized religion they feel like it's not for them, like their, their values are not welcome there, their identity is not welcome, which is really unfortunate because church and religion has given us so many wonderful things that it can give you a place to connect with the higher power, to answer your spiritual questions, to have support if you get sick or someone in your family gets sick, to have people to talk to about the places where you want to grow in your life. And if we don't have that kind of one hub for all of these things, our friend group kind of de facto can become that source of inspiration. But the the thing is that we need to do it intentionally. We need to know like what is missing in our life because there's a lot of dissatisfaction that people experience with their friends. And we need to be able to put a finger on why and what we're missing. And even just one simple example is that do you have people in your life that you can do healing work with? Uh, Simple but deep example. Because in church, you might, for example, have a priest that you could talk to about really deep, painful struggles in your life. And while I love therapy and I have a therapist, I also believe it's really important to be able to share these things with at least one or two friends in your life. And so to say, okay, like for example, for me, uh, I've struggled with eating disorders throughout my life. And so to be around other women who have experienced an eating disorder and to be able to talk about it and be in community with them is a deeply healing thing because I know I'm not alone in this experience. All these other really cool rad women have had this experience. We're going through it together. I feel less shame around this problem that I have. And like, I really just cannot uh, oversell, undersell uh, that point that it's really important with whatever thing that you're struggling with to get community support Because if we don't have it, we tell ourselves that we're alone. And that's, no matter what the issue is, it's not the case. There's always other people going through the same thing. Right. So, like, right now, like, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We're all at our homes, confined to the walls. So, what would you suggest for people to, how to create a safe space for themselves? Because this is a very unique situation itself. Yeah we haven't faced this and we do not know how to react and how to 
basically go about the mental health. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So the question is, um, how, how do we create safe spaces for ourselves online right now? Is that it? Yes. Online and like being ex like self acceptance, basically, how do we adopt that? Yeah. Well, I would say one is that you don't necessarily have to create the space online yourself if you don't want to. Uh, I know for me, my impulse is to always make the thing myself and just going into a space that someone else created can be really rich and wonderful because I can just relax and receive whatever they are offering to me. Uh, and so just to know that there's plenty of really beautiful spaces online right now. And since everything is virtual, it's this really rare moment of some of the world's best teachers are offering things for everyone right now online. And it could be really discounted. It could be free. There are so many incredible trainings going on right now. And so that, that in itself is really important. And there is also a benefit to creating a space yourself, because I think for me doing that has helped me feel like I belong a ton. It's been a sense of kind of like, I have power when I, I'm brave enough to create something. I'm brave enough to invite people. They show up and some sort of change happens. Uh, and so if you want to do that, my advice would be first to figure out what the intention of your space is to say, like, this is why people really don't love these, or at least people I know don't love these Zoom happy hours where you're kind of just like on Zoom with 20 people talking over each other. <laughs> like, it doesn't necessarily feel nourishing because you're not really connected with people. Um, and so to say, like, what is the intention? Is it, I want to invite 10 of my female friends and we all share for 10 minutes on what's going on in our lives so we can catch up. Uh, is it, I want to get together with the dads in my life to talk about what we're struggling with during coronavirus. Do you want to do something that's consistent? I think that's also really powerful is to say, Hey, every Wednesday morning for this month, I am going to invite 10 of my friends or five of my friends or two of my friends to just catch up. And we're going to set a timer. I'm a big fan of timers. And to say, each of us has five minutes uninterrupted to just share. And then we're going to ask them questions for five minutes. And then we switch to the next person. Uh, I think there's really, there's a lot of powerful connection that is possible with Zoom. And I've experienced it. I cannot tell you the amount of times I've cried on Zoom. <laughs> um, but just to say that, like, I'm going to take control of this and I'm going to make an agenda uh, and we're going to follow it because people, I think the fear is being too controlling. But in my experience, if people know what they're signing up for, they're really grateful that someone is taking the reins and creating an experience for them versus just trying to be chill. My next question being like now that we'll step out in a completely different world, world where remote working and freelancing will be the future. But there's often this uh, misconception or fear, I would rather say, that uh, freelancing does not pay you consistently and or as well as the corporate jobs do. So for someone who's new into freelancing, what would be your suggestion or how to go about it? Mm, so the question is like, what, as kind of like coronavirus is shaping a new world, what advice do I have for freelancers? So, yep. uh, to make more money. Is that yes. kind of it? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the biggest tip I, I always give people is like, have you asked for help? I think it's such an obvious yet underused <laughs> piece of advice. As for example, I am starting the book proposal for my next book. And I could just work on that on my own. And then when I really think it's perfect, start cold emailing literary agents. But instead, I put something on Facebook and in my newsletter saying, this is the idea for my book. 
I would love to talk to someone about it. Also, I would love to connect with your friends who might be literary agents. Mm -hmm. And now I've got these connections. And it just takes asking. And it could be something as simple as like, hey, I'm really struggling with figuring out how to do my taxes. <laughs> Does someone have expertise in this and can help me out? Because people really want to help. And it's very rare for someone to just publicly put on social media, Facebook, or directly asking someone, I'm struggling with this specific thing. Can you help me out? Uh, so that is a huge piece of advice that I have. And another is, uh, there's this book called The Middle Finger Project by a woman named Ash Amberge, who I'm a huge fan of. She really has done a lot for me in terms of shifting how much I feel like I am worth. Uh, and again, this sounds so obvious, but to me, it just like, it clicked something into place in my brain where she said, people cannot pay you for something that you do not offer, <laughs> which is like, duh. Of course people can't pay you for something you don't offer. But for some reason that just blew my mind where I was like, right. If I don't offer like a group coaching program, no one's going to email me and say, hi, I would love it if you created a group coaching program. Like I have to make it mm -hmm. and let people know that I'm offering it and then they will buy it from me, hopefully. Uh, and I guess another way of saying that is that we all have the power to create something that people can buy. We just have to do the work and believe in ourselves and believe that it's worth buying in the first place. Okay, so self-belief and initiative is what we need. Yes, completely. Nailed it. So I read this uh, in description of your LinkedIn and the last line which uh, said, lady, uh, you'll have to ask me about the story oh. behind that one. Yeah, so the, that nickname uh, it came from this thing called Camp Grounded, which is a summer camp for adults, which, like I say in my book, and I say it in like pretty much every interview, is this is really the experience that I attribute to changing my perception of what's possible as an adult. That it was the first time I met adults who were really silly and playful and open and curious and not like trying to put on this persona of like being a mature adult. Uh, and at this camp, you can't use your real name. You have to use a nickname. And so my nickname that I chose was Lady. Okay. That's the story behind that. <laughs> that was, I found it very mysterious and I thought there must be an interesting story and here we go. <laughs> You're like, gotta ask about lady. <laughs> yes, I had to. So, um, my next question being, I read this um, term toxic productivity, which, mm. which, yeah, which said that just because, uh, because someone is feeling the emptiness and lon loneliness inside them, they often hide it with continuous hustling and being very toxically productive. Mm -hmm. So, how do we identify with like, when we are be being toxic, be productive, and not um, enough self introspection. Whew. That is a really good question. That's a really good question. I, I read this term toxic productivity, and then it hit me like, damn, yes, this is something. Yeah. Oof. I think the reason I'm having this response is because I was this person. Um, I literally ran a conference for like two years called Hustle Fest, mm -hmm. uh, which to my credit, like we weren't talking about like working yourself to death and there was a good emotional balance, but I was working my butt off as a freelance writer. Like barely, like I, I think this is a really good test for if you are a toxic productive person if you keep a really accurate calendar, which I think a lot of us do, just go back the last few years and look at your calendar and see how much free time is in here. Because for me, 
my first, I'd say three years in New York City, I barely had a day go by where I didn't have something going on. Like there's always stuff, even on weekends, it was so rare to just have like an open Sunday with nothing going on or no like deadline in there. And it's like, in hindsight, looking at it now, at that time, I was just like, I want to make the most of my time in New York right. City, and I want to <laughs> do all these things, and I want to meet people. And now that I've been through some, honestly, pretty painful self-reflection of really looking at myself and kind of what, what I was trying to prove to myself or to other people that like I'm I'm smart, I'm extraordinary, I'm lovable, all of these things that we want to be seen as or I want to be seen as. Um, and knowing that like if I really took the time to to pause and be still with myself, that I would feel that deep sadness and discomfort. And I was running away from it. It was, it was a good coping tool at the time. It served me in that I didn't have to feel it. And then I did feel it and it sucked. <laughs> and I am, I like to think that now I am working on having much more spaciousness in my day because at least for me, I know if I say, okay, like this is what I've got to get done today. And like I'm going on a hike in the morning and I'm going to the lake at 6 p.m. So like between 11 a.m. and 4, I got to get everything done. And it works. I'm like, I don't have to use the whole day. I can still get it all done. Um, I think for me, if I just have a loose time container for myself, I just fill it with stupid stuff I don't need to be doing. So it's like when we're in that moment, in that hustling moment, we often feel we need to make the most out of this, get at work our ass off. And then, you know, there's this point of mental exhaustion when you reach and when you look back, you said, I was doing all of this wrong. Totally. Like, I didn't need to do that. Right. Um, I think it's also trial and error. Like, I don't know. Sometimes when I'm doing podcasts or like I read a lot of nonfiction books, or sometimes I wonder why I'm even reading these books in the first place. Cause it's like, yeah, there's all this beautiful wisdom and it feels really good to read it and listen to it. Um, and at the same time, I wonder like, do I just need to learn this lesson myself? And that's the only way I'm going to really learn it. Like I think at least for me, I put a lot of shame on myself for not learning things sooner. But it's like, I learn it when I learn it. I learn the lesson when I need to learn the lesson. And so right. if anyone is listening and is in this kind of like really going after a mode, like maybe something will happen and then you, you won't want to do that anymore. They're like, that's okay. Yes. Like whatever works for you, hit and fight, right? As you said. Yeah. So I would just um, wrap it up with one last question for the, for today's podcast which would be, what is your one piece of advice to all the people who are suffering with mental health issues and loneliness during this time? Yeah, who I would say one, you're not alone in this. Like, we are in the ultimate experiment of mental health. Like, we're not getting enough physical touch. We're not getting enough face time with people. We're not getting enough social time with diverse groups of people. Uh, it's, it's a huge test for anyone, no matter how great your spiritual practice is, no matter how you're like neurotypical you are blessed to be. We're all struggling. Uh, and also know that there's a ton ton of incredible resources right now for people because of this, like really great hotlines. Um, I wish I could think of something off the top of my head, but just like if you Google like emergency hotline coronavirus or like emergency mental health hotline, there are so many things that already existed or have been created 
where you can just talk to someone who is not judgmental and is open and is trained to be a good listener. Because sometimes I think we just need to get what's on our chest right. out okay. to someone who will not judge. Uh, and so I, th so I think one, know that you're not alone. This is very normal. Two, call a hotline, get a professional's advice, see if maybe working with a therapist is a good option, if medication is a good option for you. And also there's, um, there's a really great podcast called Mental Health Media, uh, which is run by my friend Jesse, and he talks to people all along the spectrum of neurodivergence where like they might have been, there might be bipolar, they might have OCD, might have had eating disorders. I've been on his podcast talking about the experience of loneliness. Um, and it's, I think it's really beautiful because it's people who are truly in it, who like I, I have never suffered from clinical depression or OCD, bipolar, any of those things. So I can't speak to that experience. And he talks to people who can. Uh, and one other resource I'll give is this incredible company called Made of Millions, where it's, again, people talking about their journeys with mental health. Uh, I've been on their, they have like an Instagram feature. I've been on there to talk about eating disorders. But I think it is the most honest accounts of mental illness I have ever seen where people are really talking about stuff that they felt a lot of shame about. Like for example, intrusive thoughts, which I'd never even heard of, of just like these, these dangerous thoughts popping into your head that you can't stop and you feel like it's your personality. Um, and people who dealt with that for years, not telling anything, anyone because they felt like there was something wrong with them. Um, the founder has a really beautiful magazine article about his experience with intrusive thoughts and it's educated the hell out of me. Um, so those are, those are all my tips. That was a lot. <laughs> right. So thank you for creating such a safe space to talk about this issue. Mm. And I really appreciate the time. Though it was too of early course. for you. <laughs> I, was, I was like, okay, we're gonna get up. It's Saturday morning. This is why I'm wearing my robe. <laughs> Thank you, Mashika. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.